Welcome everybody. My name is Dave Farnsworth. I'm an associate here at RAP. We have two presenters today. RAP Senior Advisor, Economist Jim Lazar, and Tommy Vitolo, a Senior Associate at Synapse Energy Economics. More about them in a second. First, let me clarify the process over the next hour. Jim and Tommy have about a half hour presentation. Then they'll answer questions until about five minutes of the hour, followed by Jim wrapping up with some final thoughts. You can enter your questions through the questions pane on your GoToWebinar control panel. There they are. The official portion of the webinar will end at the top of the hour, but we like to address as many of your questions as possible during the live session, so we're going to stay on the phone for up to 30 minutes after the close of the main session to continue the discussion. Since there's so many of you, we prefer to hold the questions until the completion of the presentation. The exception, of course, would be if that uh, any one of you has a burning clarifying question. If you do, type that in and we'll do our best uh, to get those answered. The presentation is going to be recorded so we can put it on our website and so others can access it at a later time. Uh, finally, we ask you just to take a couple minutes after the web webinar to fill out a survey. It's short, just a couple questions. And, um, you know, getting your thoughts uh, really helps us to be more responsive to you all in the future. Our presenters. Well, many of you are familiar with Jim Lazar, who's written and presented on many topics, including rate design, renewable energy integration, consumer participation and electric utility planning, and incentive regulation. We also have Tommy Vitolo. He earned his PhD in systems engineering from Boston University. And Tommy has extensive experience uh, as a consultant, a researcher, and an analyst. His work at Synapse includes a focus on utility resource planning, variable resource integration and valuation, and avoided costs. More information on both can be found at the RAP and Synapse websites. With that, why don't we get started? Well, good morning. Uh, I'm Jim Lazar. Uh, and I've been with RAP since 1998 and worked all over the world with RAP. Uh, today's webinar is sort of a, a, a look at the value of solar, which is a hot topic around the country. And I'm going to start with a very, very brief overview of net metering, uh, because net metering is what most states use to compensate customers that install on-site solar. Uh, where the number of kilowatt hours that flow through the meter in both directions throughout the month are netted against one another. Net metering is simple. It generally did not require any new metering. Existing electric meters, even old analog meters, would run backwards as well as forward. In most places, there was no time of use element to net metering. Uh, most rates around the country, residential rates around the country, have no time element to them, although an increasing number do. Uh, and so power produced in the middle of the day was valued exactly the same as power consumed in the middle of the night by the solar customer. As solar has become more prevalent, net metering has become viewed as something of an infant industry subsidy by many. And infant industry subsidies have been with us for a long time. The railroads received land grants to expand into the western United States. The airlines received airmail subsidies to help launch an aviation and an air passenger air in industry. Uh, and the semiconductor industry received subsidies in the form of uh, defense contracts that helped launch the very technology that we're using today. Value of solar analysis is a broad term. Studies can be very narrow, looking only at the short-term value received by the utility system, or they can be very broad in scope. And we'll be talking about that entire range uh, over the next half hour. There are really two different views of cost recovery uh, that we, we see out in the world. Sort of the traditional utility view. Uh, that the utilities costs are made up of uh, generation investment costs, generation operating costs, and distribution costs, and those add up together 
to produce, in this case, the retail rate of about 12 cents a kilowatt hour. Many utilities view the value of a solar in the short run as being only avoided fuel costs. That is, you have enough capacity to serve the load, you need to have enough capacity to serve the load, and the only thing that happens when solar flows into the system is that the fuel use goes uh, up or down. Utilities operating in restructured regions, New England, Texas, and a few other states, where customers buy their kilowatt hours from someone different from the distribution utility, generally all of the generation costs are built into a single generation rate, and maybe that's the cost that varies with uh, solar coming into the system, but the distribution costs don't vary. And in this traditional utility view, the failure of solar customers to uh, pay the distribution charge uh, for all of the kilowatt hours uh, that get used at their site uh, is viewed as a subsidy. Now, solar advocates view this a, a whole different way. Uh, for solar advocates, there is a large stack of benefits from solar. Yes, the traditional utility, generation capacity, generation fuel, transmission, distribution, line losses, reserves, uh, ancillary services, environmental benefits, local jobs, uh, and, and sometimes many more benefits are identified by solar advocates. From the solar advocates' perspective, the portion of these costs that makes up the utility revenue requirement uh, of, in this case, 11 or 12 cents a kilowatt hour is only a fraction of the total stack of benefits received. In the simplest of terms, the traditional utility view is an embedded cost view of what's in place today, and the solar advocates view is one of uh, a long-run marginal cost perspective. What costs are we uh, avoiding uh, by doing things different? Now, there is a tremendous range of solar valuation studies. There are narrow, and we'll talk about each, each category. There are narrow studies that look just at the short-run cost savings. There are long-run studies that look at the generation capacity and energy value uh, of solar, but don't look beyond the power supply value. There are a category that I'll call broad utility sector studies that look at generation, transmission, distribution, uh, and other utility system values, sometimes line losses, reserves, ancillary services, but don't look beyond the utility sector. And finally, there are extensive, so, 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 extensive societal studies. These look at uh, things including regulated emissions, not yet regulated emissions such as carbon, uh, and perhaps other societal benefits such as uh, economic benefits within the service territory uh, or beyond. Now, each of these categories of studies considers different groups of costs. The narrow studies look at variable costs. The long-run studies look at variable and capital costs. The broad utility studies look at those variable and capital costs and a subset of externalities, those that either do immediately affect the utility sector or perhaps those that will likely someday directly affect the utility sector. And the extensive studies look beyond that. They look at uh, as many externalities as can be valued. Uh, and at societal costs. And different costs are treated very different in each of these categories of studies, and frankly, even within a category, there's different treatment of different costs for production, transmission, distribution, whether they consider average line losses or marginal line losses. Marginal line losses are much higher, and we have a separate paper on our website on the issue of uh, valuing marginal line losses whether they look at current or future environmental costs, whether they look at fuel cost risk and fuel supply risk, uh, because solar is a, there's no fuel risk, whereas with any other, any conventional fuel, there's always the risk that the fuel cost could change or the fuel supply could become unavailable. And then whether they look at macroeconomic effects. Uh, within or beyond the service territory. 
couple of years ago, the Rocky Mountain Institute uh, did a uh, fairly extensive study of different value of solar studies that had been prepared. And this is not a current list. This is a few years ago. But they ranged from as little as four cents a kilowatt hour to more than 30 cents a kilowatt hour. The average uh, was about 16 cents a kilowatt hour. Well, the average residential rate is less than 16 cents a kilowatt hour. If the average of these studies were a reasonable representation of the value of solar, we would conclude that the average residential rate undercompensates the solar provider, and therefore that net metering is a good deal for the utility system and not a fair deal not generous enough to the solar provider. So I'm going to start with some of the narrow, you know, some concepts of the narrow studies. They will typically look at fuel and purchase power. They usually look at line losses, but most often they look at the lower average line losses, not the higher marginal line losses. And they will look at the utility's current out-of-pocket environmental compliance costs, their costs that they, if it's in New England, their costs for Reggie allowances, if in California, their costs for California carbon allowances, and their costs for operating uh, their uh, existing pollution control equipment on their systems. Some look only at the power supply cost. Some may look a little bit beyond power supply costs, but mostly the narrow studies take the position uh, that power supply is the only thing that varies. A good example of this is a study that Nevada Energy uh, did last year. There was a situation where the utility had adequate capacity, in fact, excess capacity, and they are aggressively acquiring renewable resources at the system level, and they still have conventional resources available to back them up. Uh, in that situation, the fuel savings uh, were the primary short-run benefit. And as in the docket that, uh, that that study was presented in, the commission ordered an eight-year phase down of net metering pricing. Uh, they modified the rate design for existing solar customers with a higher fixed charge and a lower variable charge. That has since been invalidated by a Nevada court, and all of the parties reached agreement on an alternative alternative approach that does grandfather in the existing solar customers, but new solar customers are still subject to the modified rate design. Uh, so that's a, 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 a pretty narrow study, just looking at the, uh, the short run. The broad utility sector studies are the ones that are generally now being called uh, a value of solar study. And I'll talk about a few, and Tommy will talk in more detail about one of them. Examples are the study that the consulting firm E3 did for Nevada, uh, the study for Mississippi that Tommy will be talking about in a couple of minutes, uh, one that was done for, clean, for the state of Maine by Clean Power Research, uh, one that has been done repeatedly uh, for Austin Energy and is in use today in Austin. Uh, and one for the uh, state of Minnesota. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the study that E3 did for Nevada. They uh, looked at the value of solar for the existing installations through 2013. Those are the ones that had uh, the most capacity value to the system because they were uh, coming on uh, and providing power during peak hours. Uh, and were expected to do so, but they also had the highest costs to build. And in that, they found the benefit uh, over the lifetime was on the order of uh, 32 cents a kilowatt hour, uh, but the costs were higher than that. And then they looked at the 2014 2015 installations and found that the benefits and costs were just about the same. And then looking forward at 2016 and beyond, they found that the benefits were slightly smaller than the costs. But on average, they found that the cost and benefit uh, of solar was about equal. 
Uh, but that was not the study that formed the basis of the Commission's decision there. Now I'm going to turn it over to Tommy to talk about the Mississippi study in a little bit more detail. Hey everybody, I'm Tommy Vitolo, and whereas Jim says good morning, I say good afternoon from the East Coast. Uh, I'm going to talk for just a few minutes about the study that Synapse Energy Economics prepared in Mississippi. Uh, it was for the Mississippi Public Service Commission. It was released in September 2014, which means, of course, it relied on analysis performed for that using data acquired even before that. And as you might expect, uh, you can find it online. And so let's have a look at the 25-year levelized avoided costs on the next slide. Uh, we're going to break it down into its components. You can see uh, the total is $170 a megawatt hour, 17 cents. A big chunk is energy. Uh, a moderate chunk is avoided transmission and distribution uh, capacity. And then you see uh, drips and drabs for a number of other categories. You don't see a category, for example, um, DRIPE, either energy or capacity, DRIPE demand. Uh, reduction induced price effect uh, because Mississippi uh, by and large is not in an RTO where we would be able to uh, see that. Uh, you also don't have avoided RPS compliance because Mississippi doesn't have a renewable portfolio standard and of course Mississippi is not part of either the REGI regional greenhouse gas uh, coalition or California's carbon trading scheme so there's no um, avoidance there either. But we do have these categories, so let's dive into them a little bit on the next slide. Um, let's talk about energy. The avoided energy in Mississippi was really high, and it surprised a number of folks. The reason it was so high is that in the early years, uh, we were showing a whole bunch of energy coming from oil CTs. To the extent that PV displaces oil, that represented a big savings. Uh, two years later, if we were to redo the analysis, I suspect we'd see lower avoided energy, both because the forecasted price of natural gas and because we're two years farther into uh, using those CTs, which is to say we're two years closer to no longer relying on oil CTs for so much energy. So I suspect we'd see a lower uh, avoided energy levelized over 25 years. For generation capacity, uh, we started with $6 a kilowatt year in 2014 and increased it up to net cone over a 25-year window. Well, MISO South in 2016 cleared out a buck nine. Uh, so capacity prices, at least in the MISO portion of Mississippi, have, have in fact gone down instead of up. I, I can't speak to the value of avoided generation either in Mississippi Power or TVA, but uh, interesting to know. Uh, we use $33 a kilowatt a year for transmission and 55 uh, for distribution, adjusted for the generating capacity credit of PV. Uh, two years later, we still don't know of any Mississippi utility-specific study that would suggest a different value. Um, those studies aren't so easy to do. Utilities tend not to do them very often, and when they do them, uh, they're not always done with the um, temporal resolution necessary to analyze uh, an intermittent but predictable resource like DGPB. Uh, system loss in 2014, we used the weighted average system loss for energy and Mississippi power specific data. Uh, I would have preferred to have used the marginal line loss. I think that's a better representation of the actual avoided cost. If we were, would have used marginal line losses instead of average, it would have been a $7 increase per megawatt hour in value. Uh, to my knowledge, there are still no utility-specific studies getting at system losses um, in the context of PV in Mississippi. Environmental compliance, uh, we used a Synapse mid-case carbon price, $15 a ton in 2020, increasing uh, linearly with SOX and NOx allowances embedded in the avoided energy benefits. Two months after, the very service commission for whom we worked claimed that the clean power plan would drop. If that were the case, I, I don't suspect it is, but if that were the case, 
the avoided compliance benefits would go up considerably, right? To the extent that the clean power plan is costly to comply with, DGPV avoids a substantial amount of cost. So if the Mississippi PSC in 2014, uh, if their analysis is correct, then an updated value of solar in Mississippi would dramatically increase the value of solar. And on avoided risk, uh, in 2014, we used a 10 percent adder applied to the other five benefit categories. I think uh, maybe a more finely tuned analysis is appropriate. Perhaps uh, some benefits uh, benefit from the avoided risk, other benefits don't. Uh, looking at the low, mid, and high value of solar case where we used a number of sensitivities, uh, we can compare it to the utility costs, that little tiny light brown uh, sliver, and the lost revenue, uh, which is the much more significant dark brown are. To the extent that the value of solar is higher, larger than utility cost plus lost revenue, then net metering has a downward pressure on rates for all customers. That is to say, other customers benefit every time somebody installs DGPV. Uh, in the all low case, we see that um, all of the worst things were to be true in 2014. That would be a cross subsidy in the other direction where uh, other ratepayers would be chipping in to help subsidize the solar customers. So our Mississippi study uh, concluded that, uh, in the Mississippi at least, it is indeed the net metering customers who are helping keep other ratepayers' rates down, uh, similar to that first or second slide that Jim showed comparing the uh, RMI studies with average retail rates. Questions? So we're going to take a little break for any clarifying questions on the stuff we've presented so far. Dave, do you have any clarifying for us? There are no requests for clarifications, so I think you can continue. All right. Uh, so I've just put sort of the study that E3 did for Nevada, which I categorized as a broad utilities study, next to the study that Synapse did in Mississippi. Uh, E3 having considered generation, transmission, distribution, line losses, and avoided RPS costs. But there are some things that Synapse had considered in Mississippi that E3 did not consider in Nevada. Solar admin costs, uh, market price effects, price risk, uh, grid support services, outage costs, and the 10% uh, the adder. The, uh, the, the risk or non-energy benefits that was considered by, by, by Synapse. So they both broad utility studies in the sense that they're looking at long-run utility system costs, but they're not looking at exactly the same utility system costs, and so one needs to be paying attention. Uh, another way of looking at some of these broad utility sector studies is to put several of them alongside. Uh, in this case, those that were done uh, for Maine, Minnesota, uh, the medium case that Tommy presented for Minis Mississippi, and the most recent one published by Austin Energy. And they're, you know, kind of clustered in the in the 10 to 16 cent a kilowatt hour range, pretty much the same cluster as the RMI studies from a few years ago. And similar to that, if we drop the average U.S. residential rate uh, across these broad utility sector studies, what we find is that net metering, uh, that is compensating customers at the retail rate uh, on a volumetric basis, uh, for it's based on all of the utilities costs for production, transmission, and distribution, uh, is generally a little below the value of the resource that the utility system is, is receiving. Obviously, a very different basket of values. Uh, but they work out to having quite a similar uh, net value to the system. Now I'm going to move on to what I'll call the expansive societal studies. Uh, and these are most often presented by parties in, in proceedings that are solar advocates. They consider values that are in addition to those in the utility revenue requirement. Uh, future environmental benefits, including carbon costs local economic development, 
values. Uh, the value of energy independence. I even had one solar salesman convince me that solar was going to improve my love life. Uh, and that turns out to be true, and you can ask me about it in the question session. Uh, these often show very significant value generated for the public, for the non-participants, even with full net metering. So here's a, a table of, of the presentation that was done uh, in, uh, in Colorado by a, a consulting firm, Cross-Border Energy, comparing how the utilities study had measured the value of solar to how they were measuring it. They had, the utility had in, included avoided energy, transmission and distribution loss, and fuel hedging value but had undervalued, according to the, this consultant, the avoided generation capacity and T&D costs, undervalued air pollutant costs, and omitted entirely a whole set of, of other values, grid support services, grid security, reduced water usage and power production, land, job creation, economic development, and health benefits. So in the more expansive study, uh, the Colorado consultant found, I did study similar to, to that that was Tommy presented from, from Mississippi with a low base and high cost of gas forecasts and concluded that the uh, when they added all of these values together, uh, including only a 10, they assigned a 10% benefit for all of the societal benefits. A value of solar of 16 to 21 cents a kilowatt hour, 163 to 207 dollars a megawatt hour, significantly above the retail price, uh, and that consultant therefore concluded on the basis of this expensive study uh, that net metering was a net benefit to non-participant customers in Colorado. Now, there's an important difference that sometimes needs to be considered, and that's the difference between high-cost utilities and low-cost utilities. Many utilities around the country have very low rates due to embedded low-cost resources, uh, and Seattle with a large hydro base is a, an example of that. Uh, but their marginal costs, their costs to serve growth, their incremental costs to build new clean resources and get that resource into the service territory, uh, may be similar to those for higher cost utilities. So here in this graphic, I've put, you know, five utilities uh, down and their average residential revenues. Uh, and in green, sort of the low end of the results of the value of solar studies, around 10 cents. At the high end, the red line, sort of the high end of the value of solar studies that I showed earlier. Uh, which are broad utility sector, not societal studies, at about 16 cents. And we see that the cheap utilities fall below this, and for those utilities, net metering is really, uh, you know, uh, produces a, a significant net benefit for the utility. They're getting a resource worth 10 to 16 cents uh, at a cost in the form of lost revenue of about eight cents. At the other end of the spectrum for a very high cost utility like San Diego, it's possible that net metering uh, does have a, uh, ad, a an adverse impact on the non-participants. But for the majority, about 80 percent of the utilities in the United States have residential rates that fall in this 10 to 16 cent range, and for those utilities, net metering may be about fair. Uh, true by happenstance, not by and specifically, you know, a direct comparison of costs. The basket of costs and the basket of benefits are quite different. Now I'm going to turn to someplace a couple thousand miles southwest of all of these utilities that I've talked about so far, to Hawaii. Things are a little bit different in Hawaii. Uh, yes, there are subdivisions where almost every single house uh, has solar installed. In this particular neighborhood, you can see both solar water heaters and solar PV systems on most of the homes. In Hawaii, they've run into a changing value of solar as solar installations become more prevalent. And 
Uh, Tommy talked a little bit about things changing just between 2014 and 2016. Hawaii had full net metering until 2015, and the Honolulu system, about 30 cents a kilowatt hour on the neighbor islands, uh, higher than that because of their higher uh, costs of the small systems in uh, the Big Island and Maui, Molokai, and Lanai. Uh, that continues for the existing solar customers, but for new solar customers, initially Hawaii uh, last year uh, shifted to just a marginal fuel credit for grid supply installations. And that was set at 15 cents a kilowatt hour as the credit customers would receive when they're feeding power to the system. So where they would pay the retail rate for the power that they take from the grid, uh, but when they're back feeding, they were, would only get 15 cents. They've now run out of capacity for that, and in the third quarter of, of this month, uh, no new grid supply systems are permitted uh, on, uh, on some of the systems, and I think it'll be to all of the three Hawaiian electric systems uh, soon. Customers who want to install solar can only do so if they install self-supply systems that cannot backfeed to the system. Uh, and that's creating an interesting market for load control and on-site storage and scheduling of loads uh, that will, I think, produce some interesting results for the whole country. Uh, but it certainly uh, squashed uh, new solar applications in Hawaii. Well, things have, are a lot different in Hawaii. This is a table uh, that uh, was prepared about a year ago that showed how much the installed solar is as a percentage of the system peak load. And on the island of Maui, 18% of all customers have solar installed. And that installed solar, which can deliver it, you know, at noon on a sunny midday on a sunny day, is equal to 53% of the system peak demand. Nowhere else in the country is above 5% of customers uh, having solar. That would be California approaching that level. And in most of the country, it's less than 1%. So think of this as a postcard from the future uh, for sunny regions. Now, this is the most complicated thing we will present in this webinar, and I hope you're able to follow it remotely. This is a graphic that uh, Hawaiian Electric prepared a couple of years ago now. Uh, it showed the system profile for a week in June, and they selected the weeks to be comparable in terms of weather. Uh, beginning in 2006, and the most recent, the red line, is 2014. 2006 was really before solar took off in Hawaii. Uh, and at that time, the 2006 peak demand was about 1,200 megawatts at 1 p.m. Uh, so right in the middle of the solar day, clearly driven mostly by commercial customer load, which is what's dominant at 1 p.m. By 2014, the peak load had declined to 1,050 megawatts, down about 13%, and that peak load was occurring at 7 p.m. Now, now the peak load occurring after the end of the solar day. Now, how fast did the utility have to ramp up its resources to meet its peak demand? Well, in 2006, they had about a 500 megawatt ramp from a little under 700 up to uh, 1,200 megawatts in that seven-hour period. Pretty fast ramp up. By 2014, that had changed dramatically. The ramp between 6 a.m. and 1 p.m. was only 250 megawatts. Actually, much easier for the utility to manage. Then has a little bit of a plateau in the middle of the day, and it ramps up to the 2014 peak of 1,050 megawatts by, by 7 p.m. But it's actually an easier load to serve. But what you can see in the red line here 
is what we call the duck curve beginning to appear, the load actually declining a little bit at midday. Uh, and this was in 2014. There's been a lot of solar installed in Hawaii since then. And indeed, they are beginning to see uh, the load uh, subside. On the island of Molokai, the smallest of the islands served by Hawaiian Electric Industries subsidiaries, uh, the middle of the day is the lowest load time of the year on the system because solar is serving so much of the load that the rest of the system has the least work to do. Well, it's not only true at, you know, at, at the system level or the individual customer level, when you look at that subdivision that I showed, you can see that that whole neighborhood was likely at midday going to be producing power into the grid. And by 2012, they had individual circuits that were back feeding to their substations. And that was OK, because these substations have multiple circuits on them, and the power would just go out across a, a different circuit. By 2014, in this diagram, uh, between 10 and 2, this is an entire substation. This is load in megawatts on the vertical scale. And this is 46 kV level back feeding up to the transmission level of the entire substation going negative. And you know, that is a, basically a substation serving a predominantly residential neighborhood was back feeding. Now, substations can be designed to handle this, and they can be modified to handle this, but it's not part of the original design, and it's not free to modify them. So circumstances are different in Hawaii. I do consider it a postcard from the future of what happens when you get up into the 15 to 20 percent uh, of customers having solar. Most mainland utilities uh, are a very, very long way from having this kind of thing occur. What's interesting about Hawaii is that the challenge has been more difficult at the generation level than it has been at the transmission and distribution level. The flexibility of, of a, you know, if a circuit was designed to handle two megawatts going to customers uh, during uh, the highest part of the day, it could actually handle more than two megawatts of solar installed. They've now increased the, uh, they increased the uh, uh, circuit cap to 250% of the minimum daytime load. Uh, in, in, uh, last year uh, as to when solar would be acceptable on a new circuit. So I've ended this with a little discussion of Hawaii being a little bit different. Uh, we've now got uh, some time for questions and answers, and if there's still questions, we'll go, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pose the formal uh, part of the webinar uh, on the hour, uh, but we'll, Tommy and I will stay on for another half hour if people still have questions. So Dave? Great, thank you, uh, Jim. Thank you, Tommy. Um, as as soon as I opened my mouth last time, uh, there were some clarifying questions that um, I apologize for not getting to sooner. One question: uh, What are oil CTs? Obviously, they're combustion turbines. They were that was explained shortly afterwards. The term cone, C-O-N-E, that's a New England ISO term uh, referring to the cost of new entry, so a new new resource. Um, there are a couple questions, Tommy, that have to do with risk. Um, the first one is, why is risk included in the slice in benefits stack? And I think that's on the DG PV cost benefit slide. The second one, well, maybe, maybe Jim can go back to that slide. The second question about um, risk, uh, were the avoided energy costs based um, on natural gas futures? If yes, wouldn't that include implied price risk? Sure. So the, to answer the first question, to the extent that um, the lack of DGPV includes a risk, which as Jim mentioned earlier, could it be the risk of uh, the fuel source, be it fossil or nuclear, uh, price changing over time or simply the availability um, if your fuel doesn't show up, uh, that's a risk as well. To the extent that EGPV 
mitigates those risks, it provides a benefit to the utility system. Uh, and that's why it would appear uh, as one of the slices along with avoided TMD and avoided generating capacity and so forth. The second question had to do with using natural gas futures. The, the trick with natural gas futures is if you go to uh, the futures market, you can get really good data on the futures uh, spread, that is the, the buy, the bid and the ask, um, six months out, 12 months out, 24 months out, 36 months out. You cannot get very good data about what people are willing to pay for the natural price of natural gas today for gas delivered five years from now or 10 years from now or 15 years from now. Very few people, uh, very few entities are willing to engage in that kind of trading. And so in this particular study, in the short term, it was oil combustion turbines, not natural gas fired combustion turbines that were driving the co avoided cost of energy in the short run. Uh, oil-fired units were on the margin. It wasn't until the out years that natural gas uh, is on the margin, and the uh, the NYMEX spread data for those years is simply too thin to use. I'll, I'll give an example of where risk became a real serious issue. Uh, during the 2000-2001 West Coast power crisis, that, that crisis, the original triggering event was uh, lack of, of snowpack in the, in the Northwest. And the Northwest stopped exporting power to California. California fired up their natural gas turbines. One of the gas pipelines from Texas uh, had an explosion in New Mexico and went out of service. Gas wasn't available. Hydro wasn't available. It is neither the fuel for the hydro resources, water, nor the fuel for the gas resources, natural gas was available, and the result was the price spiking uh, to uh, extreme levels that uh, ultimately forced uh, one of the California utilities to file for bankruptcy protection. Thanks, Jim. Uh, another question about the Mississippi study. What's the basis for the $55 per kilowatt number um, that you use for uh, avoided distribution costs? Sure. We um, developed an in-house uh, it's called a database, might be a bit excessive. We collected uh, as many uh, publicly available data sources as we could for both avoided T and avoided D. Um, since we didn't have Mississippi specific studies, we instead used uh, national numbers. And, uh, and again, just cranking through the existing data we had from around the country, recognizing that no two distribution systems are identical, uh, $55 a kilowatt year uh, for pure capacity uh, was the number that, that was actually uh, remarkably uh, the median and the mean, uh, or at least very, very close. Uh, and then, of course, we adjust that for the capacity um, that TV provides, which is not one kilowatt of capacity for every nameplate uh, kilowatt of the PV system. And that, that value will vary from region to region and system to system. Uh, a system that peaks at, you know, between noon and 4 p.m., there will be a very significant capacity value for solar. Uh, you know, a system that peaks in the afternoon and summer months. On the other hand, for a system uh, the peaks in the morning and the winter months, a winter peaking system, uh, that capacity value would probably not be there. The illustration I showed for Hawaii showed that between 2006 and, and 2014, they had an actual reduction in peak demand on the system, so there clearly were uh, transmission and distribution capacity benefits. But once that peak demand had moved to 7 p.m., new systems built in Hawaii probably will not be providing that kind of capacity benefit. The capacity benefits were sort of tapped out. Um, right okay. okay. Uh, go ahead, Jim. No, go ahead. Okay. Uh, another question for Tommy. Uh, please discuss the TRC test benefit cost ratios under various sensitivities in the Mississippi study? Oh, you're um, 
<laughs> I, I don't have the the full study in front of me, and certainly don't take the the time to rifle through it. Um, I'm happy to to have a conversation with someone offline about that, but it it's not. It's, I don't think it's the kind of thing we can chat about uh, in front of the, the 500 folks on right now. We don't have the time. <laughs> okay, we we will share the uh, the name of the person who sent that question in. Yeah, um, let's, let's take you. it offline. For, well, for both of you guys, what are the marginal line losses as opposed to average line losses? Jim talked about that, and uh, Tommy did as well. Jim, could you give us some background, and then Tommy maybe fill in? Sure. Uh, line losses have two components. There's core line losses, which are the, the energy required to activate the transformers, to energize the transformers. And then there are resistive line losses, and that's the majority of them. The resistive line losses increase with the square of, of the current that's flowing across the system. So the peak time line losses are much higher than the off-peak line losses. And because they vary with the square, if the formula is, is, is I squared R, the first derivative of that is 2IR, which means that the marginal line losses, the increase in line losses from a circuit going from being loaded Two megawatts to 2.1 megawatts are two times the average. The resistive losses are two times the average resistance losses. What we find is that the marginal line losses, when you take all of these factors together, are about one and a half times the average line losses at any hour, and the on-peak line losses are about twice the average line losses, and when you multiply those together, the marginal losses that the system incurs or saves by load going up or down at the peak hour uh, can be as much as 30%. Uh, as uh, and we have a paper on that valuing the contribution of energy efficiency to marginal line losses available on our website. The same principles that are in that paper would apply equally to any distributed uh, supply resource, whether it be solar or battery or, or combined heat and power, any other resource that's delivered onto the system at the distribution level would save the system marginal line losses, which on peak can be as high as 30%, and the marginal line losses across the, the solar day are typically in the 15% range. And to add on to that, if you think about the hour where the system load is at its highest, right? So this is the 4 o'clock August Wednesday, uh, 100 degrees outside sort of day. For most systems, that's a pretty good guess for, for your generation capacity to meet load, including line losses during that peak hour. And so to the extent that DGPV reduces the need for generating capacity, you also, in addition to not needing the, for example, 10 megawatts of capacity because you have 10 megawatts of DGPV performing at that, at that time, you also reduce the capacity you need to simply overcome the line losses. So you get a generating capacity multiplier to the extent that you can reduce your, your line losses during the peak hour. So not only do we need to properly capture the line losses for the sake of determining the energy benefits, we also can get a capacity benefit. And the other thing I'd add is that um, very often utilities are calculating um, average line losses because they're calculating the line losses for PERPA dockets where their assumed generator is uh, a CHP that operates all 8,760 hours of the year, and they use average line losses because, uh, well, it's uh, it's we're, we're avoiding line losses each hour of the year, and that's the number they, they publish. Well, DGPV tends to av avoid losses during hours when line losses are higher, and so the line loss analysis used in PERPA hearings isn't appropriate for value of solar because it's undercounting line losses because PV's output is positively correlated with load. And, and in most systems, in most parts of the year, 
uh, it's sunny when the load is higher and it's dark out when the load is lower. Great, thank you. How important is an accurate and or revised avoided cost methodology as a foundation for a state value of solar analysis. Indiana has an administrative rule with a formula and variables which results in an avoided cost of two to four cents per kilowatt hour. Do we need to revise this before we try to do a value of solar study? In my opinion, the, those kinds of avoided cost studies are typically uh, short-run studies uh, and are uh, probably best not used uh, in valuing a solar asset which is a 20 or 25 or 30 year asset being added to the system. Uh, it's more appropriate to use a, a long-run approach and if the avoided cost methodologies are looking at, you know, things like current system dispatch. By their very nature, they're looking at the portion in the small red oval here, uh, the generation operating costs that vary in the short run, not the stack of, of benefits and avoided costs that occur in the long run. And I would just add, in general, one of the questions that's really important to ask is what is the what is the purpose of the value of solar study is it to make public policy where we care about local jobs is it rate making where we're really focused in on cost causality and um, efficient price signals uh, right what it what reason for the value of solar study, what question are we really seeking to answer? Because until you get to that, uh, you don't even know which, you don't know which categories to include, you don't know the length of the study, the discount rate, uh, so you really got to know what, what question you're trying to ask with the results um, when putting together uh, an appropriate value of solar study. Okay. Can you provide an explanation um, as to why so many utilities don't believe the results showing up in value of solar studies? And do you have any suggestions for strategies to change utilities' minds? Uh, well, I, I think that the, it, it, it's partly a matter of, of a, an embedded cost versus a marginal cost view of the world. If you're looking backwards, at, you've got a large investment in distribution system that was built to serve all of your customers' needs. And now it's only serving the, all, it is serving all of the needs of some of your customers and some of the needs of all of your customers. And it's providing a place for people with uh, excess generation to dispose of their excess power. You look at the green area on the left here, the distribution component of, of, of the system, and you say, that customer's net metering to zero kilowatt hours. They're using the grid half the time to take power from the system. They're using the grid half the time to deliver power to somebody else on the system, but they're paying nothing for the grid. And in an embedded cost perspective, that's true. Uh, and I think that's why most utilities look at it this way, is they just say, the grid's expensive. They're using the grid. They should help pay for the grid. And if they're net metering to zero kilowatt hours, and our grid costs are built into the price per kilowatt hour, they're not paying for the grid. And the, the only way that, you know, that you can change their conclusion is to change the question uh, that, they're, that they're, they're, they're answering, which is, in the long run, is the, are the customers on this system better off or worse off as a result of a new resource? Solar is not the same as a conventional generating resource. It's new, it's clean, it's delivered inside the service territory at the distribution voltage level. Uh, it helps avoid a bunch of other system costs uh, that might be or will be incurred in the future. Uh, and if you don't look at all of those future benefits and future cost avoidance, you're you're going to get a very different result. It doesn't mean that the result will be 
that net metering is the right answer. As I showed, there are some utilities where the retail rates are uh, well above the, the value of solar. And for those for those systems with those very high prices in the you know the 20 cent range, uh, it may be that uh, even even a value of solar study is going to show uh, that net metering would be in the long run a detriment to the customers. I, I don't presume that the result of taking a long run approach for any individual utility, but a long run analysis will produce a different result than a you know, forward looking analysis will produce a different result than a backward looking analysis. And there may be other uh, perhaps motivations for utilities to to not like the idea of paying other folks a significant amount of money to generate electricity, but I'll stick with, with Jim's very polite view of a very enlightened utility. Okay. Uh, we have time for a, 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 a brief answer here before we have to wind things up at the top of the hour. Um, here's the question. Or here's the statement. I haven't heard any of the presenters talking about the need for solar customers to pay their fair share of distribution costs that are not avoided with solar. Reliability of service, poles and wires, customer call centers, mandated programs, grid infrastructure investments, such as AMI and new technologies, etc. Don't we need to build up the required costs for solar customers based on this proposition? Uh. That to me is is generally an embedded cost perspective. If there are incremental costs of adapting the system to accept solar, then those are marginal costs. And Tommy talked about some of those, and the E3 study looked at some of those of, of grid modification costs. And certainly in Hawaii, they are now having to install voltage regulators in places that they were not needed for a top-down system and are needed for a distributed system. So there are some costs being incurred. Uh, but the, the, the proper measure is what is the value of this asset coming into the system uh, versus what is the retail price that's being lost. Every utility has had rate increases as large new power plants have been added to their system. Uh, they drove up cost. New resources cost more than old resources. That's part of where our rate cases come from. And it, if you look at the you know, forward-looking costs, you probably get a different result than if you look at uh, the cost recovery for the system that is there today as the basis of rate design. Okay. Uh, Jim, we've, we've just about reached the top of the hour. I'd like to thank you and, and thank Tommy for uh, this excellent presentation. I did a great job. Our thanks to folks who joined us as well. Um, please watch your emails. We'll be sending out links to the recording of the webinar along with the, the slide deck itself. So um, I'm going to give Jim an opportunity uh, to simply tie things up very briefly. And with that, we will have reached the end of the official portion of our webinar. But remember to stay on for the next 30 minutes. We'll continue to um, uh, try to get to your questions. As with most problems, the answer you get to depends entirely on the question that you ask. Are you looking at short run impacts or long run impacts? Are you looking at the impacts just on the utility or throughout the service territory or beyond? Are you looking at current utility impacts or future utility impacts? Are you going to consider societal effects? Uh, things like the health impacts of lower emissions or the uh, local job creation uh, or avoided imported fuel costs, uh, fuel being imported into a state or into a service territory. Uh, clearly, the utilities that have very high PV saturation, and I'll say above 10%, are different. Those are utilities that may need to start looking at the cost of adapting their distribution system. And then certainly not a problem with having new solar customers treated uh, differently when that saturation level is reached than existing solar customers. 
for very low cost utilities, a compensation rate such as a feed in tariff, something more than net metering would provide, may be the appropriate compensation to recognize marginal cost values uh, that may be higher than retail rates. How you approach the valuation of transmission and distribution costs and losses, risk avoidance, and environmental costs are very important. Finally, I'm going to end with a plug for a resource that's just becoming available at Pace University, the value of Solar Center for Excellence. Their website is there. It's a site that's being populated with studies that are being done all over the country uh, on this topic. Uh, and it may be a good, good resource for the future. And with that, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jim. So uh, with that, we've, we're ending our, our formal 60-minute presentation. But um, let's continue with the questions. Here you go. Isn't utility lost revenue a short run and forecasting issue? If the utility forecasts DG adoption accurately, then current rates should recover revenue requirement, right? Uh, probably, but rate cases tend to occur in, you know, three to five years apart and and things can change. In the last five years, sales per customer in Hawaii dropped 22 percent, roughly one-third solar, one-third programmatic conservation, and one-third other things, you know, appliance standards and building standards and, and things like that. Hawaii has a decoupling mechanism, which makes sure that the allowed revenue requirement is fully recovered uh, by the utility. So this dramatic drop in use per customer has not had a, a big adverse effect on the utility's financial uh, stability. But without that decoupling mechanism, without annually, regularly going in and truing things up, the short-term effects could be significant. Uh, and I don't think that you're going to address that uh, with forecasting uh, alone. Uh, because this is a disruptive industry and it doesn't behave uh, uh, as well as my mother once hoped that I would behave. Okay. What does not seem to be addressed in anything I've heard so far, <clears throat> this was a question raised at 20 past the hour, um, anything I've heard um, so far is the question of what happens when we have a deep penetration scenario. It seems highly unlikely to me that there will be T and D savings. Rather, I imagine the grid will need different kinds and larger transformers that the wires would need to be bigger, etc. If one just takes an incremental view of distribution, this would not be true. But at massive scale, it's very hard to believe T and D goes down. Well, I've, I've put the Hawaii uh graphic over uh, back up again. And what it shows is that the entire system load is, is lower uh, sort of throughout the day, uh, and, which means that the distribution system probably, and transmission system certainly, is adequate to, uh, to handle. There's now excess capacity that there wasn't. The total peak demand is lower. The total load at almost every hour is lower as a result of the combination of solar and efficiency and, uh, and the other effects that I mentioned. Uh, clearly, though, the cost of, of managing voltage regulation uh, when the system was designed to get power to customers uh, in a one-way fashion and is now sometimes that power is being generated close to the load and sometimes it's being generated at central power plants is an additional cost. And as I said, once you get above about 10% saturation, it may be that the value of solar for future solar customers is different from the value of solar for the initial solar customers that will generally have the effect, uh, the, the initial first 10% or so of customers installing solar will have the effect of reducing uh, loads on the system. Because if my system is producing surplus, on a system with less than 10% solar, chances are that power is going to get used within a couple of couple of blocks or even a couple of houses of my house. The system isn't going to carry it very far. <laughs>
Uh, but once you get above 10%, yeah, I think that there are costs, and, and the Hawaii emission, once the solar saturation there hit uh, uh, you know, 10%, they started looking at it, and when it got to 15%, they actually ended traditional net metering. I would add. You. I would add. Make. I would make a couple of comments. The first is that, um, yeah, this is why it's important to uh, not perform a value of solar study and put it on the shelf for 10 years, uh, but rather to continuously update as our understanding not just of the price of natural gas and resource plans change, uh, but also as the saturation uh, and distribution of the DGPV uh, moves forward we're going to come up with different numbers. And, and for some futures, it's easy to imagine that some of the benefits go down and some of the additional costs go up, giving us uh, a different result. The other thing I'd say is I have a, uh, a more optimistic view of uh, future technology in the following sense. I think that driven uh, by Hawaii and California, we're going to see uh, a grid where users uh, are shifting their demand not by uh, setting uh, timers on their lights like, like folks have been doing since the 70s, but using their smartphones and their smart thermostats and their smart electric vehicles and all these other smart things, smart as we say in Boston. And I think what we're going to see is demand pushing around to make better use of these variable resources uh, so that this this net load which in Hawaii is shifting towards 7 or 8 p.m. Uh, will move forward again and when that happens because either we have good rate making uh, we have good rate making and we have good technology uh, these these additional costs and reduced benefits because of increased solar saturation um, that pendulum will swing back again. And solar will, in fact, continue to be quite valuable simply because we're going to push demand around in ways that we're not doing now, uh, but will be so valuable to do. One of the things Hawaii has done has uh, you know, been to put new solar customers that were after about starting about a year ago on a time varying rate so that their the credit that they get, the prices that they pay are higher during the high load part of the day, uh, particularly the early evening, and lower during the middle part of the day. And as utilities get to have, you know, utilities that have time varying costs should be considering and implementing time varying rates. And if the solar is producing at the low value time of the day, then net metering will credit those customers with a lower value during the low value part of the day and charge them if the early evening is the high cost period as it is in Hawaii now at a higher rate when they're taking power from the system in the high cost part of the day. In that situation with a time varying rate a customer could net meter to zero kilowatt hours but still be paying the utility 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 dollars a month in essence for storage because the high cost they're taking power from the grid during high cost periods and feeding power to the grid during low cost periods and you know there, there's a, a, an equity issue should the early adopter solar customers be exposed to the same rate design as the late adopters that's one that commissions are beginning to have to deal with the Hawaii Commission has dealt with it they are choosing to treat new solar customers different in Nevada they're now choosing to treat new solar customers differently uh, and that's an you know important uh, consideration uh, for the regulators but time varying rates are an important part of it RAP has a whole publication and a webinar on our website on this the subject of adapting loads to resources and resources to loads it's called teaching the duck fly, named after the California duck curve, uh, and it has 10 different strategies. Tommy mentioned some of them, but storage air conditioning, ice storage air conditioning, controlled water heating, uh, controls on water and wastewater system pumps, uh, selective charging of electric vehicles, 
changes in rate design are all among the strategies that we talked about in that paper, and I invite you to download the paper and view the webinar. Great, thanks. Please discuss the difference between average values versus locational value. Don't most of the most or all of the values of solar studies treat a bunch of the variables as averages when it might make more sense to treat them as differentiated by location? Examples could include avoidable distribution and transmission costs. I'll give a short answer and hand it off to, 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 to Tommy. If we have the data to do locational studies, uh, then it makes more sense to look at the costs and benefits on a more granular basis. If a utility has a particular part of its service territory that is facing imminent needs for capacity upgrades to serve a peak demand at noon, then solar would be a particularly valuable resource in that location, as would energy efficiency that addresses the midday load. Uh, if, on the other hand, a utility has a portion of its service territory that's loaded up with solar and is at noon backfeeding to the grid at a rate that's uh, close to overwhelming the substation to which that neighborhood is attached, uh, then additional solar would have a very high cost of grid adaptation in that node. Uh, and it would be ideal to, to be able to recognize that on a node-by-node -node basis. Very few regulatory commissions have gone that far. The state of Vermont for many years identified each year a couple of nodes for their energy efficiency programs to focus on to help avoid uh, transmission and distribution cost upgrades. And that kind of locational analysis can be very valuable, but it's not very common. And, and I would add that um, as you get into system specific, uh, subsystem specific costs, how costs vary in different places in the same, for example, distribution grid of a particular utility, there's exactly one organization, it occurs to me, who is well suited to explore that detail and exploit those opportunities, and that is the utility itself. And unfortunately, there don't, doesn't seem to be, at least yet, very many utilities who are viewing um, DGPV and other distributed resources as an opportunity to reduce their capital investments. Uh, some might suggest that the very way we compensate electric utilities uh, could explain that. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, it would be incredibly difficult for a third party analyst uh, to get into that level of detail. And furthermore, um, while there are certainly a few cases where that level of detail has been remarkably valuable, uh, right, the, I believe it was Brooklyn and maybe Staten Island, I don't remember exactly, there was some, some ability to avoid some really expensive distribution infrastructure investment in parts of New York City by using DG. Uh, and folks figured it out and, and presumably saved a big chunk of change. Uh, for the most part, the cost of, you have to be careful and make sure that the cost of figuring out where there are these opportunities doesn't exceed benefit of exploiting them with surgical precision. So uh, to the extent that it's low cost to discover these opportunities and high value to exploit them, absolutely we should be doing it. Utilities should be looking for it, and whether or not we have different uh, compensation packages to customers, or we could simply, for example, a utility could identify a portion of its grid and encourage its customers there to explore DG options, or move their interconnection requests to the front of the queue. Maybe not change rates, but do other things to foster DG in the, in the places that provide the greatest benefit to the utility system, uh, unfortunately, we haven't seen a whole lot of utilities embrace uh, these opportunities to the benefit of their customers. What does one of these studies generally cost, and how much would it cost to get more accurate and real-time data to keep the studies up to date? I mean, I think you're, 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 you're yeah, you've done it. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, 
So the answer, of course, is it depends, uh, starting with how much money you have to spend. Uh, in all seriousness, uh, it depends a lot on whether or not the utility is um, interested in helping, being compelled to help, or not helping. It depends on whether or not the utility is located in an RTO or not. It depends on whether or not the utility owns its own generation or pays a wholesale capacity price for generation. Um, and it uh, depends on a variety of other factors, right? RPS compliance, uh, carbon, all of these categories. Uh, some, right, it's very easy for me to calculate the cost of RPS compliance in Mississippi. I'll do that for you for free. It's zero. There's no RPS policy. No amount of DGPV avoids RPS compliance because there's no requirement for RPS compliance. So that's a freebie. I'll give you that one for free. Uh, but if you ask me the same question in Maryland, well, that's complicated. To the extent that um, distributed generation is net metered, it reduces sales, which reduces the utility's obligation to purchase renewable uh, energy credits, RECs. And therefore, uh, every megawatt hour of DGPV reduces the utility's RPS compliance costs by different amounts in different years, both because REC prices change and because the amount of RECs required by the utility to purchase change from year to year. So uh, we, can, we can continuously sharpen pencil, um, but again, at some point it sort of becomes um, very difficult to get past a particular a, a level of, of granularity or a level of precision without uh, the utility at least being forced to answer questions, and if they really want to answer those questions and, and be helpful, even more so. I think that there are certain areas like utility-specific avoided transmission and distribution costs where uh, you really need uh, the utility engineers and third-party folks to work together and come up with, with really good numbers. And absent that, we use regional data. We use other studies as proxies. Um, but let, 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 the other studies as proxies is a good place to jump off uh, for something I wanted to say on this, which is, you know, for very high cost and low cost utilities, it may be important and necessary to do them. But for the vast majority of utilities, where their retail rates fall in the range of where the the value of solar studies that look broadly at at, at costs and benefits are are producing results. Uh, may not have a need to go away from net metering. I mean, the system costs come up to 12 cents a kilowatt hour based on production, transmission, and distribution costs. That's the retail rate. The value of solar is in that range uh, based upon the marginal values of the resources that uh, uh, the, the solar or other DG resource help avoid. And that metering, uh, in, in this case, for Austin, Kansas City, and Detroit, the utilities whose retail rates fall in the range within the range of the studies. If you just use the other studies as a proxy, it looks like net metering is is not precisely accurate, but it's it's in the right ballpark and it's simple and it's understandable, uh, and customers can relate to it. May be acceptable for, for for the high cost utilities or the low cost utilities. You may need to be doing a location-specific study. And I think there, the answer, the simple answer to the question is it's tens of thousands of dollars to do uh, a study. It's not hundreds of thousands of dollars to do a study. And it's oh, thousands well, of Well, Tim, if you want to do energy uh, dispatch modeling and you want to do a transmission study and a distribution study, you're in six figures. You okay. want to do all three of those. Yeah, I can, I can give you one of them for, for for mid five figures, but if you want two or three of them, you're in six figure territory. Okay. And Can you speculate on public interest rates? Got it. Can you speculate on how the other studies, uh, how these other studies would change with greater penetration and when backfeeding is required? Would net metering payments need to be lowered? Uh, and did Hawaii take the correct action? Uh, well, Hawaii needed to take some action, and they took a logical action. The logical action was they grandfathered the existing customers who had invested in systems expecting a, 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 a pricing framework to be stable, and the commission 
recognized that and respected that the early adopters. And I think the commission was aware that the early adopters provided greater value than the latecomers do simply because they know that the system peak has moved so it's no longer in, in, in solar day. I'm not sure their understanding goes a lot deeper than that, but maybe it doesn't need to. So then the question is, you know, the first step they took was to provide a time varying compensation uh, to the solar customers. I thought that was definitely the right step to take. The next step they took was to shut down all systems that have any back feed. Uh, my gut reaction is that that was too broad a stroke to take to eliminate all grid supply from, from new systems and require them to uh, never back feed. Obviously there are some times that the grid might like to have that back feed or it might be an economic value to have that back feed and at least the step they've taken so far forecloses that for new systems. I think that a smart utility that operates a smart grid connected to smart inverters purchased by, by smart customers ought to be able to come up with a little bit more sophisticated system than just to say no uh, to backfeed. Uh, and I think that they've given up uh, some, there are certainly some hours when that backfeed would be beneficial to reduce fuel consumption. And I, I think they might have, uh, with, with the, uh, the, the no backfeed, uh, the self-supply option, have gone a little too far. But I'm not sure the grid or the utility are quite ready to handle the complexity of controls that would be needed to optimize that backfeed. It would be nice if commissions not located in Hawaii would remind their regulated utilities that, um, you know, Hawaii has a really good excuse. That PV came, came really fast and there was no prior art in the United States for that much PV. Um, but every other state is following. And to the extent that utilities can plan distribution infrastructure now for a future with more DGPV, they can lower their total system cost relative to Hawaii being forced to catch up to all of this PV. Uh, I'm not so sure how much that's really happening, and I don't know, you know, how much consumer advocates are supportive of that versus being defensive about utilities using this as an excuse to to overspend. Yeah. But but it would from a from a minimizing total utility cost over time. It sure would be nice if utilities were investing in their distribution grid now, preparing for uh, the increased DGPV that's coming everywhere eventually. Uh, yeah, I mean, exactly for example, one, one of the big problems in Hawaii initially was voltage regulation. That they, you know, they were needing to install voltage regulators on distributed systems, uh, you know, out, out on the distribution system to to adapt to the fact that sometimes the power is coming from above and other times it's coming from, from out on the circuit. Uh, but smart inverters can provide that function to the utility. Uh, and if you have a smart grid and smart inverters and a smart rate design, you can come up with a compensation framework that compensates the customers with the smart inverters for providing that function and then the utilities not needing to invest in voltage regulation. Uh, the important thing in Hawaii is that really none of this became a real big challenge operationally until the uh, solar penetration passed, got, got above 10%. There were really very few costs uh, of adaptation. There were lost revenues due to reduced retail sales. There was the need to redispatch power plants. Uh, they didn't have the optimal power plants for the new shape of their load. Uh, and as they replace those power plants, they'll replace them with very different resources. Uh, but from an operational reliability perspective, uh, it was you know, the, the first, until they passed 10%, there were very few challenges. Can you talk uh, a little bit more about the costs of modifying a substation for bi-directional power flows? 
Uh, you know, neither of us are engineers, and we probably shouldn't. The, the, uh, you know, the voltage regulators that I've seen are either separate devices from the station transformers, and either manually or automatically step, or modern station transformers have uh, stepping built into them to provide the, the voltage regulation. And it depends on the vintage of the substation and the vintage of the station transformer, whether you would think about replacing the station transformer for to reduce line losses and to uh, provide voltage regulation, whether you would add voltage regulators at the station or whether you would adopt a service standard that required smart inverters that could provide the voltage regulation function uh, on a distributed basis. Uh, and knowing which of those is the best and least cost solution uh, is a complicated question. Yes. Okay, we had both you guys weigh in. That sounded smart. Um, which states or regions are leading in pricing solar accurately, and, and what are they doing and learning that others could benefit from? Uh, well, I, I, you know, frankly, in terms of pricing, California has devoted a tremendous amount of of the commission's time to. Uh, residential pricing and to commercial pricing where solar is present. In a decision a couple of years ago, they ordered one of the utilities to reduce its demand charges by 75% and move those charges into the time of use rates for commercial customers. Uh, because the commercial customers that had solar, Costco, Walmart, and so forth, had brought a complaint case that said, our systems our stores have their highest demands on cloudy days. Those are not high load days for the system. So our peak load is actually a benefit. You know, the company's getting uh, a, a, a huge bonus from charging us for non-coincident demand on, shady, on cloudy days. Uh, at the residential level, they're moving gradually towards a default time of use price for all customers and in the case of net metering, that means that if the low cost part of the day is, is 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. because of the amount of solar on the system, that'll be the lowest cost part of the day. If the high cost part of the day is 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, and, and includes a lot of, of hours after the solar production has ended, those customers will be, solar customers will be paying a lot for power they consume during those high cost hours. And you know, as I said earlier, customers could be still net metering to zero kilowatt hours, but wind up with a pretty hefty bill um, at the end of the month if their usage is during high cost hours and their supply is during low value hours. Now, I would I would look at the California's uh, analysis. They've got the biggest records. They've got the the most parties in their dockets, uh, and I think the most sophisticated studies. I think Hawaii is moving in a in a logical direction. Uh, I think that now that Nevada has limited the, uh, the the new tariff to new net metering customers, that maybe Nevada is moving in the right direction once they reach the agreement on grandfathering the existing systems. I would just differentiate between which states and which state commissions. Uh, if we're willing to think about all of the things that commissions can do plus all of the things that policymakers at state government, either through the executive or legislative branch, can do, then we're talking about pricing solar not just in a um, sort of myopic reduced cross-subsidy point of view, but perhaps in a grander what is the what are the public policy objectives our state would like to reach? And if paying more dollars for solar uh, gets us the, the solar that results in more jobs or fewer emissions or some other state value, uh, well, that might be entirely reasonable. Whereas uh, a state, but if the state has policies where they're not interested in um, tallying the economic, local economic value or the local environmental or environmental justice value, uh, well then 
paying less for solar might be a perfectly reasonable thing to do as well. And so we can think about the commission level of are we following bond buy principles, right? Do, are we getting are we getting utility recovery with rates that represent long run marginal costs and provide customer incentives to do the things that create the most economic value at the least utility cost? Or are we trying to accomplish something bigger than that using public policies? I think we want to be careful to to be considerate of both of those uh, valid and very different viewpoints. Well, thank you. Um, great points. We've reached the end of our, our 30 minute uh, overtime here. I want to uh, thank Tommy and, and Jim again for um, a, a great job. I, I have to say that we've, we got through about 30% of our questions uh, in this 90 minutes. So um, folks should, should realize that um, we have emails for both of these gentlemen and we'll do our best to be uh, as responsive to those outstanding questions as, as we can. Again, thanks so much for joining us and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye now.